Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. In a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here is your host, Mark Newbold. That's not true. That's impossible. So, David, tell me, you, you spent, I don't know how long you spent working on the Galaxy Britain Bill, but you've done an extended edition, and you're also doing or releasing Toy Empire, which comes out as we speak tomorrow. So, what possessed you to take on two projects at once? I don't know. I think a moment of madness. I think, to be fair, it was one of those moments. I thought, what? Should, wouldn't it be good to kind of... Well, I mean, the thing with, with the Galaxy Britain Bill, I kind of came up with the idea um, back at the beginning of uh, 2016. It was February 2016, and it was not long after um, The Force Awakens had come out. And yeah. I, my, my love of Star Wars had been reignited. And I I think, you know, I don't mind saying this, I'd seen The Force Awakens at the cinema mainly on my own, nine times, Yeah. Uh, because I was so enthralled. I felt like a kid again watching Star Wars. Um, uh, and I'd kind of gone back to that moment of, of being young and, and, and all the nostalgia wrapped up in it and, and seeing all our favourite characters. And, and then it got me thinking about you know, the filmmaking process and um, uh, how much of it had been done in Britain in the first place. Yeah. And then I was coming back from a shoot I'd been doing in London um, and I was clicking through Twitter as one does idly on the train, and I saw that Mark Hamill was doing a, um, a talk with the, the Cambridge Student Union. I thought, oh right, wouldn't it be good to get him. Anyway, he agreed to do the do an interview, and then uh, the powers that be said, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, but it didn't. It, but that kind of made me think, well, actually, there's there's more to this. So I started kind of ferreting around and, and trying to find the people that were involved in in the making of the original film. Yeah. And it went from there, really. I had a meeting with Disney, and then we filmed at Star Wars Celebration in London in 2016. And then we got John Mollo, the costume designer. We got Robert Watts at Elstree. And, yeah. and uh, it, it just kind of snowballed. Anyway, so, so to cut a long story short, we made, over the space of about a year and a half, we pulled everyone together. We made the, the original Galaxy Britain built, which was went out in de- December 2017. Did very well. The critics were very kind. To be fair, they've been very kind again this weekend. Um, and the fans loved it. Mark Hamill tweeted about it. It went on BBC World. Um, and, and I kind of half put it to bed. But I always kind of thought, well, there's, there's a lot more that we, that we filmed that I never saw the light of day. Yeah. And I said, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be good to kind of drag that out? Because you've got all these lovely stories that have, that have been... We interviewed, you know, we interviewed these people. Um, sadly, two of them are no longer with us, Gary Kurtz and, and John Mollett. Yeah. So I thought there's a lot of gems here that we've got, you know, in the can. So I, I went back to BBC Four and I said, look, you know, we can extend this um, if, if you if you so desire. Um, December is the end of the, the, the Star Wars saga, the Skywalker saga, if you like. I know there's going to be new ones, which is fantastic, but this is the, the end of it for us, yes. the, where we began. Yeah. In 1977. So I thought, pitch it to them and see what happens. Never expected them to go for it. Well, they went for it. And then at the same time, I also um, had been approached by a, a good friend of mine, Rick, who said, have you thought about doing something on power toys, Star Wars toys? And I was thinking, really? Are people that bothered? Would people really care oh, yeah. about that kind of, kind of story? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and the more we looked into it, uh, and then with Matt, who I made Galaxy with, we, we chatted about Toy Empire. Um, at that point, it didn't have a name. And, and that kind of snowballed. So, so Rick became part of the production team. And, um, yeah, BBC4 went for both. And we got, we, got, we got an investment in the end from BBC Arts, BBC World, BBC4, and BBC English Region to make that half hour. Yeah. And, and I said, why don't you put that in one night? And, and here we are on the brink of Star Wars night on BBC4. That's fantastic. I mean, obviously, you time that perfectly with Rise of Skywalker out within within a week of us speaking right now. It's going to be out in the world and making, know, yeah. making crazy money. So you've, that's been beautifully timed. Uh, the, the the logic of going and doing a story about Palato, I mean, old old school fans like me just dribble with glee at the thought of anything Palatoy. Um But do, did you... When you went into that, were you conscious that there was also a lot of fans who would have no idea 
who or what Palatoy was, because Palatoy ex- ceased to exist as an ongoing concern in what eighty five, eighty six. It was gone. So did you? Did you really have yeah. To, yeah, trying to get that across. Mark, you're spot on. I mean, I, that's what I was. I was worried about. Uh, I thought, obviously, you know, the, the deal for, for Star Wars toys, the Star Wars toy range, went to Kenner, and everyone knows the story about how you know Bernie Loomis got the story, and there's that wonderful documentary. Um, you know, the, the, the toys that made us the very yep. first one in their series yep. about Star Wars toys, fabulously made, gorgeous series. Um, and I thought, well, that story's been told. Um, growing up, you know, I was I was born on May the 4th, 77, yeah, Star Wars Day, and I always had Star Wars toys. I still got them to this day. Did, did I really care whether they were Palatoy or Kenner? <laughs> Looking back, I probably wasn't so bothered. Yeah. But actually, without the Palatoy connection, they wouldn't the, the the market in the UK wouldn't have necessarily had the Star Wars toy range to the extent that it did. Yeah. Um. So so obviously Bernie wanted he wanted Power Toy to to be on board. Um. And Bob Simpson, who was the managing director of Power Toy at the time, they were doing very well with Tiny Tears and especially Action Man. I mean, Action Man was the big sell, wasn't it? It came out oh, in absolutely sixty six, and and was just doing so well. Um, and ironically, Star Wars would end up becoming would be uh, end up becoming the main competitor to to Action Man, uh, to to toy brands within the same company. But I, I realised that once I it, 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 the thing is that whenever you make a documentary, it's always it's always the people that make the story. So so the the thing that always struck me about the Galaxy Britain built, and I always use my wife as a benchmark for this, is that. She's only ever seen Star Wars once. Right. And I hate to say this, doesn't have much interest in Star Wars. <laughs> there we are. I've said it now. I've said it now publicly. It's out but there. Yeah. She enjoyed the documentary. Yeah, it's out there. She loved the documentary because it's these people telling their stories of endeavour, yeah. of ingenuity, of um, triumphing against the odds. And we, we all like that kind of story. Very much like the story of Star Wars itself. You know, these wonderful, the, the wonderful fairy tales that George Lucas put together to make the wonderful movie that is Star Wars and the Star Wars saga. And I think that as humans, we're, we're intrigued by, you know, other humans endeavor and, and what they've done to make something work. Um, whether it be building a, an airplane or, or making a movie. And I think that that was very much the case with the galaxy of Britain built. So I thought, well, if we take the same kind of, and if we have the same kind of mantra for, for toy empire and we get these people and we, and we went and I had this meeting, um, because the old Power Toy factory in Leicestershire is, is a conference centre now. Yeah. So these guys have all stayed in touch for, what would you say, they've been shut down in 85. So they've been, they've stayed in touch for, you know, 35 years. And they're all in this room. And, and I walk in and I'm, I'm about to I meet them all. I think, okay. Anyway, they're all telling, and I go around the room and I kind of do a brief interview with each one of them just to kind of get an idea of what they're going to tell me on camera. Yeah. Well, every one of them, Mark, was just, was just knockout. I just, you know, things about um, how how the, the trade weren't interested, how they struggled to get the retailers to take the Star Wars range, um, how they got buyers interested in the end, their, their initial reactions when they went to the... Because they were invited to preview screenings as, as the designers. Yeah. So they got to see Star Wars before other people did. So they got to see what they were going to be making. Um, and people on the assembly line and how, how much pressure they're under in the month of Christmas. And, and I thought, actually, there's enough here to make a, a rather nice little tale and tell their story. Because to my knowledge, I don't think anyone's really kind of drilled down into the, the story of, of Palatoy and, you know, the designers and the, the assembly line workers and the, those people that, that worked around the clock pretty much to, to get the Star Wars toys out. Hi, Paul Blake here, Greedo from Star Wars A New Hope, and you're listening to Fanfare Tracks. I think there's something very... Um in a very British way, very warm about the whole thought of Palatoy because you've got the American base of Kenner in Cincinnati and they've got the license and they're sculpting the figures and, and that whole craziness is going on in the States. And then in 78, it comes across to the UK and we start rolling it out under our own banner. But it just felt very, even as a kid, I remember thinking, well, this is this is home, this is us, this is ours, you know. Even as a little kid, it seemed to make sense that Palatoy was a British brand. Like you say, Action Man, Cindy... Uh, all those all those toys that we knew as kids, you know, you knew it was a palace or it was a recognised brand. So there just seems something very British about it. Oh, very much so. And I think as well, when you look back at the old palace logo in the red, white and blue, 
yeah. you know, red, white, and blue of, of the Union Jack as well. It it it, it kind of evokes that um, national pride. You feel like there's that almost subconscious connection to it. Yeah. But 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 there is that there is something special about about Palatoy and. And, and, you know, it, it was in this very unassuming town called Coalville. You know, you had toy manufacture and coal mining. And that was, and it, there it is in the middle of England, um, pumping out Star Wars toys. Um, and when we made the documentary, I, what, another thing that struck me as we went along, and again, kind of in parallel to the Galaxy Britain built and, what, and the struggles that George Lucas and co. had making Star Wars, there were there were parallels with the guys at Palatoy trying to get the, the toys made, yeah. the toys sold, uh, the trade interested. It was very much that kind of, you know, uh, David versus Goliath kind of story. Um, but of course, once it, it was successful, it went crazy. But those initial efforts they had to make, you think, well, why was no one interested? Because at the time, um, they told me on, on camera that, that actually any toy associated with a movie was a massive risk because if the movie bombed, if it was yeah. a flop, you were left with all this merchandise on the shelves. Yeah. So what companies tended to do was to have a TV series. So they would have something associated with a TV series because you had longevity. Um, but the guys at Palatoy also had the nod that, that George was looking at doing a, a trilogy at this point. So they knew there was, there was going to be some life in it. It makes me wonder now with, with Star Wars fans these days with the absolute swathes of products and, and films and TV mm. series that are coming out now, will they be able to grasp the comparative, de you know, barren desert of product that we had, you know, with just the figures, with Star Wars Weekly, with Read Along Adventures, you know, that sort of stuff, the stuff that we had back in the day when we were kids with the original trilogy. I think it's going to be fascinating for kids to fans now to look back at a time what nearly forty years ago when there was so little product yeah. coming out. There was, I mean, you know, I mean, we all know about the infamous early bird kit in 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 America with Kenner, um, and that didn't really affect us here in the UK because by the time the movie came out in the UK, it was the twenty seventh of December seventy seven, so you were looking at the springtime. But even then, you know, people were really wanting their. Their toys. They wanted. They wanted their. They wanted their Star Wars toys because the hype was so real. The hype was so big. They saw clips on the television all the time. They wanted to buy into that. And I think, yeah, it was a very different time. And there's one bit they didn't make the documentary where Jeff Maisie, who's the marketing director um, for Europe, says that you know kids and the consumers really wanted the new figures, but the, the toy companies didn't. The toy, the toy trade didn't want it. They just wanted the key characters. So they came up with this idea where they would do these multi-packs, which we all remember, um, the Wolves or what have you. Yeah. And then gradually over time, they would phase in your R5-D4, your, your Death Star droid, etc., just to get them out there. Because by then, Wolves didn't care because they were selling them, they were going to fly like hot, you know, hot cake. Yeah. The trade didn't want, didn't want all those alternate characters, whereas as kids, we did. Does it come across then in the, in the documentary the sense that Lucas was so savvy in keeping the rights to the licensing and, and, make, and making that a real key cornerstone of, of Lucasfilm and, and that company at the time that, that this was really the start of something very special in terms of, of branding and of tie-ins? Because as you say, you know, before that, there was, there was the odd Star Trek toy, there was the odd Planet of the Apes toy. Kids of my age had six million dollar man you know it was that sort of stuff but but yeah. star wars was like the next level and it completely changed the game it did i mean totally did. i mean we, we touch upon it i mean i didn't really want to go down the route too much of of you know the money made uh from that because of i wanted to focus on palatoy to start with we had this kind of very broad um brief and we could have we had so much in there and we just had to strip because it's only a 30 minute film yeah so we had to strip so much out. So um, we, we touched upon the fact that George Lucas, obviously, you know, this was, he was making money out of that. Um, but of course, it did revolutionize the way movies were marketed um, and the way toys are made. And we do say that a lot because, you know, the, the Bob Breakin, who's the chief toy designer at, um, at Palatoy, in yeah. fact, he, he, he worked on Action Man mainly. And his, his, the gripping hand of Action Man is based on his hand. He sculpted it from <laughs> his own hand. Wow. And it's just lovely little Sarah story, but he, it, you, know, it, it, you know, what what they were doing, and he he says that you know with an action man, you know you get a lot of Star Wars toys to one action man. Yeah. 
so all of a sudden you've got the, the scaling was changing. You got the vehicles worked because you had small figures where you could put them in, in the Millennium Falcon or, or the Atta or whatever. Um, whereas an action man, you said, I remember my action man. I remember having huge vehicles, and they weren't to scale. They yeah. looked ridiculous. But with but with with the Falcon and with you know a Tie Fighter or what have you, you've got the figures go right in there. It feels like they're part of that universe. Hi, this is Gareth Edwards, director of the best standalone Star Wars film since Caravan of Courage, called Rogue One. You're listening to Panther Tracks. Enjoy. What was the most surprising thing you learned? I mean, going in, I'm sure you had expectations of what you might come across and the sort of things you might yeah. hear, but what was the most surprising thing you walked away going, wow, I had no idea that that happened or that's the way it was done? Okay, well, I there, I, I think because I've done this for a long, you know, I've, I've known the subject for a long time, some things I'm thinking, well, I, I kind of knew that anyway. Yeah. I knew that anyway. But there are a couple of things. That's one thing, Mark. I couldn't believe it. When we, when we you know, I mentioned about... Um, uh, toys being associated with, with TV yeah. series. Yeah. And there's a lovely bit in the film. And we were interviewing Bob Simpson, who was the, um, who was the MD of, of, of Power Toy. And uh, he had a great relationship with Kenner, with Bernie Loomis. Obviously, Bernie got the, the contract from George Lucas to make the Star Wars toy range. Yeah. And um, Bernie went to, to Bob and he said, look, I really want you to do Star Wars. They're all part of the same toy group, all owned by General Mills. And he said, well, I, I, I'd like to take it. So I've seen the film. I think it's amazing. But I, I'm going to offer it to another company within the group called Dennis Fisher, who had Spirograph. They all remember Spirograph. Yeah. And I actually had to buy a Spirograph for some shots on eBay. So they <laughs> bought a Spirograph. I forgot what Spirograph was like. And I tried to get my kids to play it. I said, I said this part is entertainment, children, in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so, we got, so he, he offered it to, to Dennis Fisher. Yeah. And they said, oh, no, we can't take that. We can't say that because they needed a bit of a, a boost, you see, financially. And I said, oh, we can't say that. And I said, why not? So, well, because we're, we're doing a deal with um, a TV show called The Man from Atlantis. <laughs> and Bob said, Bob said, look, are you, are you sure? I said, no, no, we've got 12 TV shows. Star Wars is just one film. We've got 12 TV shows coming out and we're going to work with them on that. He said, are you sure? Said, yeah, we're sure. So anyway, he goes back to Bernie Loomis. And Bernie Loomis says, well, you've given them the option. They're fools. <laughs> and, then, and then he says, well, if you did the job you did with Action Man, you did, you, you do the job you did on Star Wars you do with Action Man, we'll laugh all the way to the bank. And, of course, they did. Uh, so, you know, they, it's a great story of how this, I, I did say to the MD, I said, what happened to that guy? He said, well, he, he moved to America in the end. We don't know what happened to him. <laughs> Probably living Turning in the middle of Star Wars, that. He turned down. Exactly. It's yeah. like turning yeah. out the Beatles, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's the same story, isn't it? It's the same kind of story. But turned it turned down Star Wars. And I think as well, you mentioned Mark, you know, other, other surprising things for me, just the value yeah. of, of Palatoy Star Wars toys to this day and what they go for. Because we film at an auction and it's just, it's just phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is. And and we we attend, Panther Tracks regularly attend a show down in Fordham, yeah. which is called Farthest Rump, and it's all vintage uh, and, and everything pre-95. And just when you see these toys, and then there's Kenner as well, of course, but but the eye is always on the pallet toy here in the UK. So so when you see these toys crop up, and there's just it's everything about it holding them. Well, you don't get that close to them, to be fair, but you know just the smell of it, just everything about it is so evocative of the era. Because like you say, it was a very special time for Star Wars in general, but specifically for British Star Wars fans who who kind of had a sense of ownership because we knew the films were made here. A lot of the supporting actors were British, and you know you'd see all these, you know. Dave Prowse would turn up on Tiz was on a Saturday morning and just crazy things would happen and it just <laughs> felt very British, didn't yeah. it? <laughs> it did, and it, and it, but it didn't feel... It's funny, I look back at, um, obviously, with all the, both these documentaries, I, I scour the BBC archives as much as I can. Yeah. And, uh, you know, seeing Mark Hamill on Blue Peter, it just feels so normal. I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel weird. It just feels like, oh, yeah, there's Mark Hamill on Blue Peter. Yeah. I remember that. You know, it's like, okay. As you say, it's just part of the furniture. It didn't feel... I mean, I remember interviewing Gareth Edwards for, for Galaxy Britain Built, you know, he was director of Rogue One. Yeah. And um, I said, what was it like? Was it crazy? And he said, no, it wasn't. He said it was just really normal. He said, there you are, surrounded by stormtroopers on a Star Wars set, and it felt like the most natural place to be because <laughs> growing up, that's what you, that's what you, that's what your world was. Yeah. So it didn't feel weird at all. It felt totally natural to be <laughs> on a set surrounded by stormtroopers. 
I suppose we've been in this thing for sort of 40 years as fans as well. You know, it's been it's been in our daily yeah. lives for that long. So I guess you could kind of assimilate that pretty, pretty quickly, couldn't you? Well, ho- hopefully to get the job done. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think that it's, you know, we've never known anything else, have we? I mean, it's it's a part of the culture. It's popular culture. Um, it speaks to millions and millions of people around the world. Yeah. Um, divides people at times, as we know. Yeah. But I think that it, it is a it is there's something very emotive about it. And um, it, for me, it takes connects me back to the time of you know my dad going to the cinema, um, and also that now introducing my children to it. You know, they're they're nine and six, and they they watch them all. Um, and I think everybody comes into Star Wars in different ways. You've got sure. people that came in through the original trilogy or the prequels or the or the sequel trilogy, or you know, Clone Wars, or, or Rebels, or Mandalorian, whatever it is, it's it's going to be, you're going to come into it by some conduit and be hooked for life. Well, hopefully some fans will come into Star Wars via uh, Toy Empire and the extended edition of Galaxy of <laughs> the Britain Bill. You never know. Uh, one quick question before we leave. You uh, never know, mate. The extended edition, what, what sort of content have you added to extend it out? Because it's an hour oh, and a half long now. Wow. Yeah, I have to say, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, Mark, I kind of, Matt and I, who made the original, I yeah. thinking I was to be fairly straightforward. It was not straightforward at all. <laughs> we were like, oh, yeah, this is easy. We basically got to just add another half an hour. We basically had to deconstruct the original and not quite start again, but it was like pulling it apart and keeping the narrative, but, but fleshing out other bits. And so basically what we've done is we've gone back, so we've added loads more, but we've also tinkered with the, and improved the bits we didn't like in the, in the original. Yeah. So it, 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 we've done a bit of a lutus on it, and we've gone back <laughs> and we've made it how we, how we thought it should have been. It's loads more music. It, it, it's cut differently. It feels like a completely different film just from that point of view. But I'll give you some examples, extra stuff that's gone in. So Roger Christian, set decorator, a wonderful guy, become a good friend. Um, the only story we had of him talking about the stuff he made was the, the lightsaber. Well, We've now been able to put in how he made the, the, the Stormtrooper blasters, Han Solo's blaster, Princess Leia's, Chewie's crossbow. Um, we've got a whole section with Peter Beale from 20th Century Fox. Oh wow! He was talking about the score. Yeah, he was talking about the scoring of the of the of the mu- of the film and the original two we did with him. And uh, we've we've expanded on that. And so what we've done is we've got that. And then we've also we've dug up the documentary the BBC did on John Williams scoring Empire. Yeah. Um, so we've got loads of that has gone in. Um, and then I approached the London Symphony Orchestra, their archivist, who said, oh, yeah, we've got loads of stuff that's never seen the light of day. Sorry. So um, we went to the LSO archive and they found all these thank you letters from John Williams uh, to the LSO and all their schedules and how they deal the music. And then we've done two new interviews with two of the, the LSO principals, the principal bassoonists. Uh, Bob Borton and uh, the principal trombone, Dennis Wick, who both played under John Williams, you know, and they couldn't quite believe it. I mean, to, to get their stories on camera, yeah. honestly, Mark, you know, and they're saying, you know, they they, 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 they thought, because basically an orchestra would go in and they think, oh, well, they got paid a bit more money for doing a movie score. And it was a bit of a doddle for them, you know, it was like, right, whatever it is, we're just going to get through the next two or three days. Yeah. So anyway, they did the first, they did the first thing. And it was the opening title. Of course, they're thinking, wow, this is incredible. What an amazing piece of music. Because they would sight read as well. And that's Absolutely, why, yeah. Um, you know, the, the orchestras in, in Britain were, well, still are world renowned. So, you know, they were conducting, you know, Andre Previn was, was running the show and was a good friend of, of John Williams. And he got John to come in because John hadn't worked with the LSO before. Anyway, they did the opening title. And, um, you know, you've seen this one or two shots kicked out of the, the screen behind them. Anyway, John Williams and, and Lionel Newman who was from 20th Century Fox, had yes. a music section there, also was helping out. They go back into the, into the sound mix to listen back, and at that point, all the musicians turned around and watched the screen. And Peter Beale from Fox said, it was amazing. He said, it was a t- and that, of course, they hadn't seen it. No. You've got the blockade runner, then the Star Destroyer, and they watch it all go through, the music on playback. John Williams then apparently comes back out into the, into the auditorium. Anvil Studios, which don't exist anymore. Yeah. And all the all the musicians stood up and they applauded with their instruments. It stood up standing ovations yeah. for John Williams. And they knew at that point they were making something very, very special. Oh wow. Um so that that's a whole we've got a whole section on the music. The other bits and bobs we've put in from Rogue One that we've put in before. I'm Anthony Daniels and you are listening to Fanther Tracks.
Well done. Another key interview. I was always desperate to get somebody else on the, on the film. I remember going through the fabulous book, The Making of Star Wars, by, by J.W. Rinsler. Yeah. One Saturday. And I thought, who's that there? Who's that, who's that woman there? Who's she? And I looked to the side and it just said Anne Skinner. So I looked her up and she did continuity on Star Wars. Oh, I wonder if, I wonder if I can get hold of her. Anyway, turns out that she donated all of her continuity Polaroids and her annotated scripts with all of her notes on and the rewrites, the BFI, National Archive, many years ago. So I contacted the BFI and they said, I guess someone's email, and I found them. And then they came back to me and said, oh, yes, we know Anne. We can get you in touch with her. So um, back in the summer, we did this wonderful interview with Anne Skinner, who was literally on every single take of Star Wars. Wow. As a continuity. So, so we've got all these Polaroids, and a, a few of them have been published, but we've, we've basically filmed them all. You know, you've got everybody, you know, all these Polaroids from Tunisia and, and, and Elstree, and, and we've got a few in the film. Um, and there's a great bit where, you know, everyone knows the, the scene where Sir Alec Guinness is explaining to, 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 to Mark Hamill you know, about the force. And uh, Sir Alec couldn't get the words right. He couldn't get it in his head. He couldn't quite get the meaning of it. So um, Anne said to George, look, Sir Alec is struggling a bit here. Do you mind if we just rewrite some of it? And he said, yeah, just show me afterwards. Anyway, so they rewrote it. <laughs> and then we've got... We've got the, the shot of the script but in her pencil writing where she rewrote it with Sir Ali, explaining the force to Luke. Um, so, of course, you take it for granted that obviously George wrote everything, but, of course, stuff has changed on set, et cetera, et cetera. And her script has the original underneath and then on the top, all the, in the pencil, how they rewrote it. Oh, wow. And that became, well, as we now know, one of the most famous features in, in Star Wars folklore. And then we also got the, everyone's feelings, the new people in the film, you know, how they felt about things. We got we put more John Mollo in, put more Gary. You know, it, it just it just kind of evolved, and there's more there's more archive we've found. We've got lovely archive from Fincer in Norway when oh, they filmed. Fantastic. There's a bit more info strikes back. Yeah, yeah. There's loads more of that in there because I think you know you see some of that stuff on on YouTube, Mark, and I think well, that's a BBC stuff. I can get that. I find out, I find the HD version of it. Yeah. I think, oh, there we are. <laughs> we'll have that. <laughs> we'll stick that in. It kind of grew a bit like the original. And now it's feature length. And it's, um, I, th I think when it goes out, I'll cry. Because I think we've done it. We've done no, it. <laughs> that's wonderful. I think, I think British fans are in for a good, good two hours of TV tomorrow night. As we speak. It's Thank you, Mark. Mo Monday so. the 16th. Monday the 16th. Nine o'clock for Toy Empire. 9.30 for Galaxy of the Britain Built Extended Edition. Yes, it, yeah, yeah. So two hours, of, as you say, on oh my word, two hours of of, uh, of Star Wars stuff. And I, kind of, kind of the, the the forerunner to what we're all looking forward to: the rise of Skywalker. Absolutely, absolutely. David, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Hope we get to speak again when you do your no, my pleasure, when you do Thank your you. next documentary because you've got to have a little break now and get Christmas out of the way, and then you know we're all expecting <laughs> you to start on the next thing. So you're on, Mark. You're, you, you're the first refusal. When, you I, when, I, when I come up with the next madcap madcap idea, the next hairbrain <laughs> idea, I'll, I'll be on to you. If you want to get in touch with Panther Tracks, this is how you do it. You can drop us an email, radio at phantertracks.com, or you can comment on our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr, any of our social media feeds, at Panther Tracks. If you want to listen to the show, you can tune in on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, listen to us on Stitcher, subscribe on Android, listen to us on Spotify, on SoundCloud, subscribe on TuneIn, listen to iHeartRadio, or even on Spreaker. We're on smart speakers such as Amazon Alexa, Apple HomePod, Google Home and Sonos. We're also available in your car, if you've got a car, or an Anspeeder, with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, or on your gaming consoles, in your television. You can find us on Fantatrax TV. You can get the Fantatrax app, can't recommend that highly enough, available on all platforms. And for any details on how to listen in or subscribe, head to the Fantatrax radio landing page on Fantatrax.com. Fantatrax.com